Late on September 8, 1910, a stiff breeze crept over Lake Michigan as a cold front swept away the last hints of summer heat. Captain Peter Kilty of the car ferry Pere Marquette 18 watched as the wind whipped up the lake. The veteran captain knew all too well what the lakes were capable of. He watched his barometer and observed the conditions as his ship, one of the most powerful vessels on Lake Michigan, easily plowed through the growing waves. He knew the Pere Marquette 18 could handle much worse than this, and feeling confident that it would be an uneventful evening, he passed command to his first mate, Joseph Brzezinski, and retired to his cabin for the night. Not long after the captain left the pilot house, the wheelsman Simon Burke noticed that the ship's wheel seemed slower to respond than usual. He reported this strange behavior to the first mate, but the issue was mild and the men didn't think much of it. Meanwhile, down below, Chief Engineer Ross Leadham was on duty when a panicked oiler, who was just sent to oil the propeller shafts, raced into the engine room. He told Leadham that the ship's stern was filling with water in the space just below the flicker. Leadham wasn't sure what to make of this, since a bit of water in these lower spaces wasn't all that strange, especially when the lake was rough. But the oiler persisted, telling him it was far more water than he had ever seen before. Leadham called up to the pilot house to report the issue, and first mate Brzezinski quickly joined him below. Together, the two men went to investigate. What they found was horrifying. The space was almost completely full of water. Brzezinski raced topside to alert the captain, while Leadham readied the ship's pumps, beginning a mighty struggle to save the ship. A fight they would ultimately lose. On November 1st, 1899, three struggling Michigan-based railroad companies merged to form the Pere Marquette Railway. Shortly after combined operations commenced on January 1st, 1900, the company looked to expand its fleet of car ferries to increase the speed and volume of cargo it could transport throughout the Lake Michigan area. These new vessels would be larger, faster, and more comfortable than their predecessors. The key to success in the car ferry business was to create ships that could operate year-round. Unlike typical lake freighters, which were usually laid up in the winter months when the lakes froze over, car ferries were expected to sail as late into the season as possible. This meant that hulls had to be reinforced and engines had to produce significantly more horsepower than the notoriously underpowered lake freighters. The Pere Marquette 18 was to be the largest and most powerful yet. Designed by Robert Logan and labeled Yard No. 412, the American Shipbuilding Company in Cleveland, Ohio constructed the new ferry. Her hull was launched on August 16, 1902, and christened by Beatrice Logan, the daughter of the ship's designer. The 18 measured 350 feet or 110 meters in length, with a beam of 56 feet or 17 meters and came in at 2,909 gross registered tons. To power through the ice, she was equipped with two triple expansion steam engines, capable of generating 3,000 shaft horsepower each. Fed by six Scotch Marine boilers, these engines powered two 12-foot fixed-pitch propellers, capable of achieving a maximum speed of 14 knots. Her reinforced hull was constructed with one-inch steel panels and double plating ran 75 feet back from her bow, extending from her keel to three feet above the waterline. Her main deck was equipped with four railroad tracks to accommodate up to 30 train cars. The upper deck was dedicated to passengers. With 50 staterooms and ample public space, she could carry up to 250 passengers along with a full load of cargo. The Pair Marquette Company saw a great deal of potential in the car ferry business for both passengers and cargo. With this in mind, they equipped the 18 with the best passenger accommodations yet for their fleet. She could also be converted for chartered excursions during the summer months. Taking advantage of her expansive cargo space, these excursions could carry up to 5,000 passengers. While not the most luxurious on the Great Lakes, she was certainly one of the finer options available at the time. 
the Pear Marquette 18 entered service on October 1st, 1902. Her owners were confident that she would soon be joined by a fleet of ever larger car ferries that they hoped would soon dominate the lakes. The Pear Marquette 18 operated cross-lake ferry services between Ludington, Michigan, and various cities in Wisconsin, including Kewanee, Manitowoc, and Milwaukee. She quickly gained a reputation for reliability, and after only one year of service, on November 6, 1903, she rescued six crew members from a sinking schooner barge called the AT Bliss. During the summer months, she was frequently chartered out to various companies to provide passenger excursions. In 1907, she was chartered by the Chicago and South Haven Steamship Company for an Independence Day voyage. The same company would charter her again for the 1909 and 1910 seasons. These pleasure cruises made great use of her expansive cargo deck by planking over her railroad tracks and installing a large dance floor, food vendors, slot machines, and picnic tables. While initially successful, these pleasure cruises seemed to wane in popularity by the end of the 1910 season, putting the future of these excursions in doubt. Still, the ferry business showed promise. In an attempt to keep their fleet as modern as possible, a number of the Pear Marquette car ferries were equipped with wireless radio equipment, a choice that would prove fortunate. As the summer came and went, she was converted back into a train car ferry. After passing a government inspection on September 8, 1910, she rejoined the Pear Marquette fleet. That very same day, at 11.30 p.m., she left Ludington, Michigan on her first cargo-carrying voyage of the season. Bound for Milwaukee, she was loaded with 29 rail cars carrying coal and other miscellaneous freight. There were 62 people on board, including 55 crew members, 5 passengers, and 2 stowaways. She was commanded by Captain Peter Kilty, one of the most experienced and respected car ferry captains on the lakes at the time. As she sailed for the open lake, she faced a stiff breeze from the north, which churned up the sea and caused the ferry to roll as she plowed through the growing waves. But overall conditions were fair, and this was nothing new or challenging for the large ferry. With no reason to believe that this would be anything other than a routine crossing lasting around eight hours, Captain Kilty retired to his cabin to get some rest before guiding the ship into port the next morning. Command was turned over to first mate Joseph Brzezinski. As they sailed through the night, wheelsman Simon Burke noticed that the wheel seemed slow to respond. He reported this to Brzezinski, but this generated very little concern. That all changed a little after 3 a.m. when a frantic call came in from Chief Engineer Ross Leadham down below. The ship's stern was filling with water at an alarming rate Brzezinski raced below to investigate. As he joined Leadham in the bowels of the ship, what he saw made his blood run cold. When first mate Brzezinski and chief engineer Leadham ventured into the space just below the Pear Marquette 18's flicker, they found the space almost completely flooded with over seven feet of rapidly rising water. While both men knew that a bit of water in these lower spaces was normal, especially in rough seas, this was far more water than either of the experienced officers had ever seen. Brzezinski immediately raced up to wake Captain Kilty, while Leadham began preparing the pumps. After inspecting the situation himself, Kilty ordered the pumps on full to try and get ahead of the flooding. At this point, the situation was calm and orderly. Kilty had a great deal of faith in his vessel, and the crew followed his example. No one knew the exact source of the flooding, but it was soon discovered that a porthole with a broken deadlight low in the ship's stern was letting in a large amount of water. This eased the tension considerably as the captain, first mate, and another crew member went to work in the flicker trying to plug the leak, thinking that this was the source of the flooding. But soon her stern sank so low that the battering waves broke open three additional deadlights on her port side. The flicker began to flood rapidly, and the men were forced to abandon the effort. In a desperate attempt to relieve the situation, Captain Kilty ordered her speed reduced and her course changed to the south so she could face the waves head-on and reduce the strain on her damaged deadlights. 
First Mate Brzezinski was ordered to gather a crew of men to help jettison rail cars to lighten the ship's load and improve her buoyancy. This was a backbreaking and dangerous process. Many of the rail cars got caught on her fantail, requiring a great deal of muscle to get them off the ship. At around 4 a.m., after jettisoning somewhere between 9 and 13 cars, the ship seemed to stabilize. Believing that they might have saved the ship, or at least bought a considerable amount of time, her crew relaxed a bit, and Captain Kilty changed course once again, now heading directly west to Sheboygan, Wisconsin, which was closer than their original destination in Milwaukee. He felt they had just enough time to beach the crippled ship, but the reprieve was short-lived. The rate of flooding soon picked up again, and the ship's stern began to submerge. Finally realizing the jeopardy of the situation, Captain Kilty ordered purser and wireless operator Stephen F. Sapanik to send out a CQD message just after 5 a.m. For the next hour, Sapanik repeatedly tapped out the message, Car Ferry 18 sinking, help. His calls were soon answered by R.G. Hill, the radio operator aboard the 18's nearly identical sister ship, the Pair Marquette 17. The 17's captain, Joseph Russell, immediately changed course and raced to save the ship's dying sister. All the while, Captain Kilty still believed he had enough time to beach the 18. Loyal and trusting their captain, the crew remained at their posts as the ship limped west listing all the more heavily to the stern with each passing minute. Passengers and crew donned life jackets, and lifeboats were prepared in anticipation of an order to abandon ship. The Pair Marquette 17 arrived at the scene just as the first light of dawn illuminated the foundering car ferry. It was obvious to Captain Russell and his crew that the ailing ship didn't have much time. They immediately sprang into action. Heavy waves made it risky to launch lifeboats to ferry people to safety. Instead, Captain Russell attempted to bring his ship alongside the 18. But as they maneuvered into position, water reached the 18's open stern and began rushing into her cargo deck. The massive influx of water was too much for the ship to handle, and she almost immediately began her final plunge. At around 7.30 a.m. on September 9, 1910, the Pair Marquette 18 sank stern first into the churning depths of Lake Michigan. The sudden plunge caught much of her crew off guard, many of whom were still at their posts waiting for the call from Captain Kilty to abandon ship. But that order never came. As she disappeared beneath the waves, a massive explosion erupted from the wreck, either caused by boilers coming into contact with the cold water or from a collapsing air pocket. The crew of the 17 immediately launched a lifeboat to rescue those who were just thrown into the water. But confirming their earlier fears, just as they touched the water, a massive swell smashed the small boat into the side of the ship and threw the four crew members into the sea. Two were rescued, but the other two, watchman Joe Peterson and scrubber R.J. Jacobson, were lost. Horrified by the incident, the men of the 17 briefly paused. But the cries from the 18's passengers and crew restored their bravery. Another boat was quickly launched, this one successfully, and they began picking up survivors. Soon, the Pair Marquette 6 and 20, as well as a tugboat from the Sheboygan lifesaving crew, arrived on the scene and joined the rescue efforts. 35 of the 62 people on board the Pair Marquette 18 were rescued. 27 lost their lives as well as the two men lost from the crew of the 17. Captain Kilty, nor any of his officers, survived the sinking. As the survivors were brought on shore and bodies were recovered, an investigation was launched, but since every single one of the ship's officers perished in the tragedy, it was difficult to discern what caused the 18 to begin taking on water in the first place. While her crew initially believed that the broken deadlight was the cause of the incident, it was determined that this breach alone would not have been enough to generate the rate of flooding she experienced. It's believed that this leak and the later breach of additional portholes only helped seal her fate, not cause it. Some believe her stern suffered undetected damage while she was operated as an excursion ship after several hard dockings under the command of her charter captains. How such severe damage could have gone undetected during inspection is unclear. 
but it's speculated that numerous hard collisions with pilings loosened her steel plates. These then came loose when under the strain of her rail cargo, which was significantly tougher on her hull than her pleasure cruises. Another theory posits that at some point during her rapid conversion back to her cargo carrying configuration, a seacock was accidentally left open, allowing the ship to slowly flood from the moment she re-entered the water. Others believe it was a leaking propeller shaft, but in the end, no one knows for sure. One thing that investigators could agree on, however, was that Captain Kilty's actions led to a greater loss of life. They concluded that his efforts to save the ship, even when it was clear that she was going down, put his crew in undue jeopardy, sealing many to their fates. Crew members like Chief Engineer Leadham, First Mate Brzezinski, and Second Mate W.H. Brown heroically remained at their posts, fighting to save the vessel, trusting that their captain would order them to abandon ship when the time came. But he never did. Radio operator Stephen F. Stepanek remained at his post until the end, tapping out distress calls even as the ship made her final plunge. He was the first radio operator to die while on duty on the Great Lakes. Almost immediately after the disaster, the Pair Marquette 18 was replaced with a new vessel that was given the same name. The wreck of the first Pair Marquette 18 was discovered in the summer of 2020, about 25 miles off the coast of Sheboygan. Her stern is buried deep in the mud, making it impossible to investigate the source of her initial flooding. What led to her demise will forever remain one of the mysteries of the Great Lakes. Thank you so much for watching. What do you think caused the flooding on Paramarquette 18? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more stories like this one. I'd like to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon and my channel members. They would be a blast on a 4th of July excursion cruise. Alright crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people. <laughs>